Welcome everybody to the online conversation on housing and homelessness. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Looks like we have 40 people with us at present. And I imagine a few people will be coming in as we get going and move past the 12 o'clock time. My name is Jordan Sullivan and I am staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. I am very honored to support the work of the many ways the church engages in um, poverty, housing and homelessness issues and that includes working with our community ministries and our partners. Uh, during our time today, we will hear from six panelists and we'll follow that with a question and answer time. But before I begin, I want to clarify a couple of important technolo technological pieces. Um, number one, this uh, event, this conversation is being recorded and you will receive a link to that. And I'll explain more about that near the end. Um, during the panel portion of the conversation, I would ask that everyone be muted and all webcams shut off or all video shut off and you see that down at the bottom of your screen, stop video and mute. And that should only be on for panelists when they are speaking. If at any time your webcam comes on by mistake, please just check it on, shut it off. Um, number two, if you have questions at any time, so if a panelist is speaking and a question pops into your mind, type it into the chat box. And to find that, again, go down to the bottom of your screen and a bar will pop up and you'll see a graphic of a speech balloon. It says chat, click on that and a chat box will pop up into which you can type your question. You can send that question to everyone or you could talk to an individual that you might know at any time. So that's a way for you to communicate when you're muted. <laughs> Okay, and so during the question and answer time, my colleague Jennifer Reed, who's sitting here beside me, I'll let you see her there for a sec. <laughs> Jennifer will be um, taking note of all the questions that are asked, and then we will raise them during the question and answer period. So right now, what I'm going to do is I am going to cut and paste the name and a link to the organizations of all of our panelists. So you should see that now in your chat box. The name of all of our panelists with a link to the organization that they are joining us from. So let's begin with introducing the panelists. Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce you to them now and they'll join us when um, it's time for them to speak. But just to go over quickly, Tessa Blakey White Cloud is Executive Director at One Just City in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Ekua Asaba Blair is Executive Director at the Massey Center in Toronto, Ontario. Lois Irvine is a volunteer and board member at Coverdale Center for Women in St. John, New Brunswick. Dallas Fiddler, who is here with me as my colleague in the office who is Healing Programs Coordinator in Indigenous Ministries and Justice at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. Steve Sutherland, Manager for the Indigenous Caucus of the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association. And Michelle Biss, who is Project Manager for the newly launched National Right to Housing Network, which is housed at the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. A warm welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to speak with us today. So let's begin with our first three panelists. They um, represented the United Church of Canada and their respective organizations at the Canadian Alliance in Homelessness National Conference in November of last year. So Tessa, I'm gonna ask you to enable your webcam and your mic. I think they should both be on. They're on, okay, I am now going to, so there you go. Tessa, a um, couple of questions for you. First one, could you share some of the ways that the people served by One Just Cities, four ministries in Winnipeg, how they experience housing and homelessness locally? 
Yeah, so we've actually unfortunately seen a significant rise in this over the last couple of years. Um, and that's primarily because of a cut to a program called Rent Assist that used to support with additional funds people living with a diagnosed mental illness or an addiction to have a safer place to live. So this means we've seen an increase in people that have recently become homeless. Um, of course, chronic homelessness uh, refers to individuals uh, that have been homeless for more than six months of the past year. And so now people are starting to fall into that category because this program was cut just about four years ago. Mm. Um, and so we're seeing also people experiencing more episodic uh, homelessness. And part of that is just that there's no real affordable housing. And I'll, I'll touch more on that in a minute. Um, so we're seeing people struggling to maintain housing, to find safe housing, and also living in housing that they don't feel safe in or living in housing that's in uh, disrepair. So even for folks who are housed, um, our drop-in spaces are often a place where they feel safer. And we kind of end up being, as outreach ministries, also a community living room. Um, so an example of this is a woman that I'm going to call Emily, um, and she uses Just a Warm Sleep. So on top of the four outreach ministries in 2017, Wonder City also opened a, a no barrier overnight emergency warming center. So no barrier means you can come in with your dog, you can come in with your shopping cart, you can sleep adjacent to your spouse, because people that are newly homeless often find it very uh, traumatizing to then also be separated. Um, and you can come in if you're on substances, so long as you can be respectful. And so Emily isn't homeless. Uh, she lives in a rooming house. Uh, and, a, and this is a direct quote. So uh, the rooming house I'm in is full of meth users and sometimes they're having really big parties and I don't feel safe there. I've been beat up and my room has been broken into. The parties happen more often in winter because they don't want to be outside and I used to just stay awake walking all night, but then I would feel awful for days from lack of sleep. When I found out about just warm sleep, I finally knew I had somewhere safe to be. So Emily is someone, and we're seeing this more and more, who has a home, but because the EIA rates in Winnipeg are such that you can only afford a rooming house, um, is in a home where she doesn't feel safe. And she's not even counted in the homeless population that we're currently serving because she would be considered housed. Um, so uh, when we're talking about homelessness, I think it's also really important to talk about that we haven't had a national housing strategy since, the since I was in kindergarten, uh, since the 1990s. Uh, and, uh, and, ha and so it's not surprising that people are experiencing more homelessness if we're not bolstering affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Tessa, could you share with us a few of the housing solutions that you learned about at the um, Housing Homelessness Conference? Yeah, I, I think the one that held the most promise for me in terms of uh, the guests that I know that we see and serve was congregate housing. So congregate housing models um, allow people to uh, kind of bring their street family inside together. So one of the things that happens when we house people is that they find it very lonely. Um, they, because when they're living on the street, they're often living in camps with other people. Um, they find it challenging because there's a lot of kind of practices like putting clothing away or doing dishes that they're just not accustomed to. Um, and so congregate housing kind of fixes some of those challenges because there's an element of bringing that street family into housing together. Um, it means housing's less lonely and also less intimidating because you're not in it alone. Um, so it allows us also to centralize supports that are needed. So people might need transitionary support to feel comfortable in housing. And what I think would be really cool and was touched on just a bit at, at the conference was that then you could have people that have been housed for a little while mentor people that are coming into housing. Um, and so how do you build capacity and strength within a population that has often been told they haven't either? Um, so I think it's, it's uh, really cool in terms of the community it can build, but also that it's cost effective. Um, tiny homes were a really cool thing and I came home and did a bunch of research and they're not even legal in Winnipeg. So they're not a solution for us, but they're being used in Ontario, especially around youth homelessness. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of innovation and, and uh, work being done on ways that people can be better supported. Okay. Um, could you tell us about one of the most impactful programs or projects that you learned about at, um, at the conference? Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, swaying on this one a little bit. I'm probably going to talk about two things, but I'll still be within five minutes. Uh, so I think this, the, there was a lot of talk again about universal basic income. Um, and so the conversation around, we've known since the 1960s that universal basic income is the best way to improve the health of everybody. Um, it has some upfront costs, but it starts saving the money that you spend on it within a couple of years in terms of healthcare costs, in terms of um, social wel welfare costs. Uh, so, you know, we've known that since the 1960s. Um, if we knew it was right then, it's kind of frustrating that we're not doing it yet. 
I feel like we're doing a bit of a disservice to ourselves and our communities. And so one of the things that I think is really challenging is that we're not actually giving people a chance right now. So over 90% of Canadians that are born into an economically oppressed family are staying in that um, wealth category and often dying early as a result and often dying still in poverty. And so it was a, a bit of a, uh, a frustration as somebody who advocates a lot for universal basic income. But one of the things that I thought was the most interesting was a bit of a juxtaposition in the first seven minutes of the conference. So uh, the conference was opened kind of with this like raw speech about how we were going to go change the face of homelessness. Um, <clears throat> and, and to me, I think that frontline workers, you know, don't have that capacity and shouldn't feel like they need to try to figure out how to do that. Um, and so I found that a bit frustrating and then the mayor of Edmonton came on right after and was like, it can't be on the front line folks. It needs to be on government. And I was like, oh, okay, good. Um, but kind of talking about, uh, how, um, it needs to be sustained government action. That's going to make homelessness eradication possible. And so I think like our organizations, whether it's, uh, you know, Wondrous City or other sites, we're often doing things with not enough of a budget, with not enough staff, with not enough support. Um, and so it is making the government get engaged and we're, um, cities were talking about really addressing homelessness in a really meaningful way. The people that were doing those presentations and the people that were doing that work were city employees. And so that was a really uh, important piece for me. Uh, there's some biases there in terms of what I think politics needs to be, but uh, I think that there needs to be a lot of engagement of the government to say, like, homelessness in your city is your problem. Um, and the frontline staff is there to support you, but they need to be taking the lead. Uh, and that's, that's not currently happening here. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Tessa. And I'm going to ask uh, Kua if she could unmute herself. Um, what I'm, I've just put into the chat box um, a link to a blog that Tessa wrote um, after uh, just sharing some of the things she shared today and, and more um, that you can check out at another time. Um, so, Akua, uh, there you are, and I will pin you. Okay. Akua, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Great to be here. Thank you. So, Akua, um, could you share some of the ways that the young women that you serve at Massey Center uh, experience housing and homelessness and maybe tell us a little bit about Massey Center as well? Great. Um, first of all, uh, Jordan, I, I want to thank the United Church of Canada, first of all, for sending us to the conference. It, uh, it was great to be in a room with uh, like-minded people working on a really serious issue in across Canada. So it was, uh, was really important. Uh, I felt really grateful to and privileged to be there and to be with others who are working on this issue collectively. So Massey Center, as you know, has, um, has, ha has been on, we, we have, um, we started in 1901 under the name The Door of Hope and became the Victor Home and later the, the Massey Center. And um, one of the reasons why we came together as an organization is because a homeless immigrant woman in 1901 showed up at the Fred Victor Mission wanting housing. She was pregnant and uh, had no family in Canada and needed a place to stay. So our history has been rooted in um, supporting, you know, pregnant women who are homeless and have no other supports. And that tradition has, you know, continued. We, we have been working over the last few years to make the service more reflective of uh, some of the issues that our young women are facing, the infant mental health, the infant, the mental health issues. And, and we've been really also working hard to be a, a, an infant and early mental health center, in addition to addressing housing and, um, other supportive needs that the young women may present to us. So we see women from 13 to 25. And these are young women who show up our, at our door because they have nowhere else to go. You know, a few weeks ago, I remember getting, we, we got a call at 5.30 in the afternoon from a young woman who said, I just told my mom that I was pregnant and I was given 24 hours to find, to leave the, whole, the house. So many of the young women come to us because they have nowhere else to go. There is still, you know, people like to think that there isn't a lot of stigma around being pregnant <laughs> and being young. And, but I have news for you. It's still a huge issue for the young women that we see. They get harassed in, you know, on public transportation. People talk to them as if they, 
they really don't exist and wonder why they didn't use the morning after pill or why do they make the choices they make in this day and age when there's uh, contraception. But people don't understand, uh, the public general public doesn't understand some of the mental health challenges or the trauma that these young women experience. So we have been over the years, um, created a number of solutions to address homelessness. So we have a residential program where we can take a young woman in at any time from pregnancy up until six months after birth and on site. She can transfer to one of our apartments, as well as uh, six months later, she can transfer to one of our um, uh, townhouses. And uh, two years ago, we got funding. We got for good funding um, to provide rent subsidies for the women as they leave the organization and, and to, to supplement the rent that, uh, that they have to pay. And in Toronto, it's a huge issue. It's just getting worse. And, um, and the women that we serve face um, discrimination. Um, many of the women we serve are women of color. And so they're poor, they're racialized, and they're young and pregnant. And uh, if you live in the city, you know many landlords still want to rent to people that fit that description. So. So we have been, uh, you know, working really hard to try and make sure that we can find housing. The subsidy is a, it's a start, but it's certainly not the solution to the problems that we face. Um, real big challenges. So, um, so we have just a couple minutes left, uh, Akua, but what would, you had mentioned the housing first approach was something that you learned about at the conference. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Some of the things that you learned about that? Well, you know, one of the things that we've been doing, we know the women come to us with housing, but um, we also know they have mental health issues. And so we have been designing programs to meet those needs. And it's, it, it's the conference and learning more about housing first is kind of flipping that thinking on its head a little bit, because now I think I'm reflecting on whether or not we need to rethink and make housing the focus. If they want housing, make that the main criteria because of the risk to the child and, and not to be focused so much on the need for the other services. Sure, we have high school on site and we have some infant mental health programs and we want them to access those services, but we are, we're rethinking, you know, just really focusing on building relationship by meeting your housing need, which is a critical social determinant of health. And we know once we can meet the social determinants of health, we can address some of the other, we can build a relationship and address some of the other needs later on. So learning, so I think we're flipping our intake process a little bit um, in light of you know, what we know about housing first and in light of uh, what we know about the affordability of housing in the community, making that a, a major focus. But the other piece related to that is a policy piece because when, uh, when you have clients living on site and uh, you're just focusing on housing, there's a lot of risk involved from the, the standpoint of hoarding and you know, damage to, the, to property. And so organizations have to build some, um, make some contingency plans to deal with some of those associated risks. Because if you're dealing with mental health, you're gonna have a number of other issues that you're going to have to face as an organization that's trying to manage and mitigate risk for the organization. Mm -hmm. Aku, I'm going to give you one minute to answer this question. <laughs> what was the most impactful program or learning that you took home from to Massey Center from the conference? Well, you know, I think what get, you know, you've all, often heard the, the phrase, what gets count, what gets measured gets counted. And, um, and I was, looking around the conference for, you know, for workshops or issues dealing with uh, pregnant and parenting women and homelessness. So there was a lot of topics that dealt with, um, uh, with women and homelessness, but not a lot with young pregnant and parenting teens issues. And I also learned the important, so I, I, we met a lot of researchers and, uh, and we have formed a relationship with some academics because I think we have a responsibility to, to partner and connect with those organizations to make sure that our population needs can be documented and researched so that that will help our advocacy and help with us and help us to, 
to generate more resources to address some of those issues. Okay, thank you very much, Akua. Um, folks, I'm putting in the uh, chat uh, a link to Akua's blog, so you can read um, that, and that has links to some of the things she's mentioned today as well. So you might find that of interest. Uh, Lois, I'm gonna ask you, let's see, I'm gonna find you first. Uh, let me just make my screen bigger. Lois is Mary, right? Mm, yep. <laughs> and Penn, there we go. Hello, Lois. Hi there. So glad you could take time out of your time with us. Um, so Lois is another one of the um, representatives that went to the uh, National Housing Conference, National Homelessness Conference. Um, Lois, um, what, was, what were some of the things or some of the things that you learned that you took home? Um, well, no, let me start. Sorry, I'm reading my, my notes wrong. Wrong order. <laughs> <laughs> Share some of the ways that the women served by the Coverdale Center um, experience housing and homelessness in New Brunswick. Okay, a lot of what um, Akua and Tessa had to say is ringing true. Looking at my notes, I'm going, yep, they said that, they said that. Um, here at Coverdale, the, um, some of the stats in the last year, 110 women have used the shelter. And 58 of those women were new, new users this year which is really concerning that the increase of homelessness is, is uh, you know, is obviously happening. <clears throat> and apparently those are the highest numbers in the last 10 years. Um, I was talking with Mary Sonia Taylor, who's the ED here at Coverdale, and she was telling me about an 82 year old woman who was using the shelter and this is her second or third time. Now, this individual is struggling with some addictions, but um, to think of an 82 year old having to resort to living in a shelter is, is kind of heartbreaking. Um, like other people, addictions and mental health are huge, huge pieces of the puzzle of why the women end up having to turn to a shelter. Here in St. John, well in New Brunswick, crystal meth is the current drug of choice. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you know, it's well known, well documented that that particular addiction can be very unpredictable in, in how individuals react to it. Um, and uh, New Brunswick's healthcare program is struggling like a lot of other provinces. And of course we've been in the news yesterday and today about that. But addiction resources are limited um, and difficult to get into. So that just adds to the whole puzzle. Um, right now, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a lot of statistics, but right now there's a 1.6% vacancy rate in rentals for one bedroom rentals here in St. John. So, and the, the average new market rental for a one bedroom is $750 a month. And a single social assistance rate is less than 560. So the math doesn't work. There are rental supplements. Some of these supplements are portable. So, you know, they can move with the, the woman to a different apartment. Challenges, it's really difficult to find apartments. 1.6% vacancy rate. Um, that's becoming increasingly difficult in St. John. Anyone who knows St. John knows that we're a very old city. We have a lot of old housing stock that in some areas of the city, it's very run down and a lot of buildings are being condemned. So, you know, there are people squatting, there are people living in places that are really not suitable for habitation. 
There's also a lot of housing that's being redeveloped from high-end rentals, which doesn't help our, our clientele at all. Um, the province has a plan to build 1,300 new affordable housing units over the next 10 years. But again, that's not helping right now. So. Okay, thank you, Lois. Um, I'm gonna give you a choice here. You have two more questions I know that we set it on, and I'm gonna let you decide which one you wanna answer. Um, so would you like to respond to the question about um, uh, accessing services or the most impactful taking home piece was for you? Which one would you like to address? I'll let you pick. How about accessing services? Okay. Um, so just a quick background. I'm a retired social worker, work with, work with the province of New Brunswick. And in my blog, I made reference to how difficult it was in my working life sometimes to access services because here's the menu of services for my program, but what my client really needs is something outside that menu of services. And, you know, even if it was within the menu of services, the red tape that would be involved in getting someone involved in a program was often so difficult. For instance, there was times where the application process, there would be a form online, we would use that form only to discover that the agency had changed referral forms. So you had to go all the way back to the start. Uh, instead of having a single consent form that a client would sign and be accepted by all departments and all agencies, we had to get individual consent for each, each different body. Um, we, um, there's been various changes of government here as there is everywhere. And of course, various changes of ministers even within those governments. And every time that there was a change, there'd then be a change in the direction that they felt they should be going. So you would be working along thinking, okay, this is great. This is what we've got. Only to discover that in central office in Fredericton that the, the mindset had changed a little bit. Um, one of the keynote speakers, Sam he, he during his, his talk, he made the comment that urgent action crowds out the important. And that really struck with me because so often working as when I did and, and still even in this environment I'm in now, so often what ends up happening is, oh my God, there's a crisis. We've got to deal with the crisis without really looking at why has that crisis happened and how can the most people be best served? So resources are spent. Uh, you know, there was one situation where I had two high needs individuals who were being repatriated from out of province. And I guess I should say I work with disabled adults. These two individuals, we had a, a multi-departmental, multi-agency team worked on finding a solution. And then even after they were repatriated, we had a great team in place, but the cost could have housed 10 times as many individuals. And this is still operating today. Uh, I know I'm conscious of the time. Um, yeah, Lois, I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap up in the next yeah, few minutes. Yeah, okay. One of the things that we really need here in St. John, and I suspect other places, is some individual who can help women living with homelessness, people struggling with anything in life, help them navigate through the system, through the various, various groups, the various agencies, the one person who knows everything that's going on and can help them. Um, yeah, 
we're, right now we're triaging. We're not, we're not really going beyond that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I have a feeling that everyone who's, who's here with us today probably has stories very similar of that, that bureaucratic mess that they mm -hmm. have to wade through and, and wade through time and time again to get the services they need. Um, okay, so I am posting in the chat box a link to the blog that Lois wrote. And now I am going to give my laptop to my colleague, Dallas. Oh, I better pin myself, right? There we go. And I will ask Dallas to speak with us. So Dallas, you're with the Healing, Pro the Healing Programs Coordinator uh, for Indigenous Ministries and Justice. And, um, what, what are some of the ways that Indigenous peoples are experiencing housing and homelessness issues um, on reserve? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Dallas Fiddler. I'm from the Water and Lake First Nation. I seen someone in the chat uh, box uh, mention that they were from Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan, which is about an hour uh, south of my community. So that was exciting. Uh, hi, hi mm -hmm. from Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, I just And before I begin, I just want to do a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, here in Toronto, we're on the uh, traditional homelands of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe uh, peoples, and uh, more more recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. And uh, just to preface my conversation, uh, I am no expert in this area. This is something that I've, uh, I'm passionate about, passionate about learning, and I'm just here to offer a uh, uh, perspective from my region. And so, so to begin. Um, Traditionally, on-reserve housing has been underfunded. And, you know, I'm sure that many of you across the country have seen or heard about that on the news maybe recently. Uh, and, you know, maybe we're tired of, of hearing it, but uh, I'm, I'm going to say it again. And, uh, you know, the, one of the reasons why it's underfunded is because the numbers that, uh, you know, uh, departmental organize, departments are, are using to find uh, or fund our, our numbers from 20 years ago. And so that's, that's one of the ways. So in, in 2016, for example, uh, ISC or federal government allocated 143 million uh, for First Nations communities on, on, on reserve to address the housing. Uh, and, and if we look at that number, uh, we divide that by 633 First Nations. Uh, uh, it equals out to about 225,000 per First Nation. And that is probably enough to maybe build maybe one or two homes. And so, uh, and, and, and it's, it's quite difficult because, uh, you know, when you have a community like mine, we have probably about 2,000, 2000 total, but we have 800 people on, on reserve. And so it varies per, per, per community. If we look at a First Nations community uh, like Onion Lake, for example, which is in Saskatchewan as well, uh, they have 4,000 4, people or th about three, approximately 3,000 people living on reserve. And so, and so, uh, so the, the money that's allocated is still continues to be 225,000 per year. And, and yeah, it's essentially, essentially it's not enough. Uh, so the 2% funding, funding cap, unfortunately for First Nations on reserve is, is, is still in place and uh, which causes over overcrowding in homes. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to necessarily, uh, want to be very con con cautious of the words uh, but, you know, unfortunately on reserve, we do deal with uh, homelessness, uh, but more specifically, we, we uh, more relatively, I guess, we deal with overcrowding. Uh, and why, why overcrowding rather than homelessness is because in, in a community as small as mine or in, uh, uh, relationality plays a very big part in, in, in that. And so instead of... Uh, uh, instead of throwing, essentially throwing people to the curve, we, you know, the families always try their best to invite uh, uh, people who are actually experiencing homelessness uh, on reserve in, into their homes. You know, if you have an extra room, sure, they can, they can stay there until, uh, 
until they 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 find a uh, find a find a house. Uh, and so, yeah, I just wanted to to bring, I guess, those uh, those few issues forward. Some of the ways that that uh, First Nations are are trying to navigate homelessness is uh, modular homes is, are being built, uh, and just to kind of give you a brief uh, summary of those, it, they're homes that are not necessarily built in the community. They're built at a specific location, maybe nearest town. And uh, one of the issues with their, th those homes is they're not necessarily built on site. And also uh, there is not any standard that they need to, that they need to follow when building the, building the homes. Another thing that we're beginning to see is the tiny home project, uh, building of tiny homes in the, you know, great initiative, it's innovative, but however, how, how do you uh, put a family of five or six into a tiny home? It just doesn't uh, necess necessarily work. And, you know, I, I was looking at some, some research data and statistics and in 2011, uh, there was a report that was released approximately 20,000 20, to 35,000 homes needed to address the housing crisis on First Nations communities. Uh, and uh, AFN uh, rebuttaled, I guess, that statement and, and said that it was closer to about 80. So those are just the uh, uh, realities that, uh, uh, yeah, and First Nations, specifically First Nations are dealing with on, on reserve. I, although, you know, I am a First Nations panelist, I, I can't necessarily speak at this moment for Inuit populations as well as um, Métis populations. Okay, so what are some of the unique challenges for for Indigenous peoples' housing and homelessness I issues um, um, off reserves? So mm -hmm. that's I think what yeah, a lot of off let's let's take an example here in in Toronto. Like an average cost of a one bedroom place in Toronto right now is anywhere between sixteen to two thousand two thousand dollars, mm -hmm. and so. How do you do? How do you how do you afford rent with that? With maybe two or three kids, it's it's impossible. And so I think, I think uh, um, one of the issues that off reserve members are faced with is uh, is uh, is uh, the issue of actually being homeless. And because uh, because of the because here in cities there's not necessarily a close knit community. Uh, between First Nation Métis and Inuit populations, uh, it is actually harder to, uh, uh, or more difficult, or people may be a bit more hesitant to welcome uh, homeless families into their homes. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I have to reiterate with uh, pre what, what a previous uh, panel said, that it's a lot of uh, racialized populations and vulnerable populations that are that are experiencing this and, and, you know, First Nations, you know, First Nations meet you and new populations are, are, are facing this as well off, off reserve. Okay. Thank you very much, Thanks. Dallas. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Steve Sutherland. Steve, um, let me pin you. There we go. And um, Steve, a couple of questions for you. Um, with the Indigenous Caucus, um, why should the government be listening to C, uh, CHRA's Indigenous Caucus to deal with the issues of housing homelessness? Yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll explain kind of what we are and then I'll answer the question if that's all right. Uh, probably should have done that first. Um, so the Indigenous Caucus and the CHRA has existed about since about 2013, uh, we represent about 120 uh, Indigenous housing and service providers across Canada. Um, and since 2018, we've had what we call our four Indigenous by Indigenous housing strategy. Um, and our argument or our plan would be that the national housing strategy currently does not address 87% of Indigenous households across Canada that live in urban, rural, and northern communities. Um, the reason the government should listen to us on this is we are the people on the ground. Uh, our membership are the people doing the work serving Indigenous communities, not on reserve uh, across Canada. So 
totally that would be where we would come from on that and and the reason i'm in this role is um we know what the stats are indigenous people are 11 times more likely to experience homelessness uh, across canada and this becomes even more uh e onerous or more difficult for Indigenous women, uh, elders, and Inuit people across Canada. So our strategy presents a way to uh, expand the envelope, because I think we can all agree that the, the NHS, the envelope isn't big enough for all of us, but we would all like to see a bigger part of that envelope, um, and how to properly address uh, primarily Indigenous housing and homelessness issues uh, across Canada. So what, what kind of things is the Indigenous Caucus going to be doing over the next year to promote and advocate its goals for Indigenous housing in Canada? Yeah, so we've just kind of, the advocacy strategy really actually started big time last week. Um, so we've, we've had tweet a -thon. Uh, we were published in the Hill Times on the need for uh, our strategy. Um, we're going to, con so we'll have a budget release uh, to try and pressure the government further. Uh, it will be, con it'll continue to be a lot of uh, meeting with uh, government bureaucrats in order to push for why our strategy will work. We know it will work because it comes from the people doing the work. Um, Further to that, uh, it will, it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of pressure, a lot of meetings. We're, we want to, I guess the reason I've been put into the role is really building relationships uh, externally as well with members of the community. It's not something that we've done significant work on in the past. So my role is to, to work with um, other Indigenous organizations and not just Indigenous organizations because we all still work to the same goal of uh, eradicating homelessness and affordable housing. Um, so that's where I see us in the uh, in the near future, at least. Okay. Thank you. Anything else you want to share with us about the caucus or your work? Or? So I would say uh, I'm really excited. So we have our national meeting in April. Um, normally the caucus only meets for one day. We have a couple of panels and a speaker. I'm really excited because we actually now have a half day that uh, the whole caucus will be able to get together, um, discuss strategy for the upcoming year, discuss where our focuses should be for the upcoming year, talk about uh, sort of strategy particularly, but also talking about allies and talking about the successes we've had. I think we need to, you know, we know what the problems are, but I think it's really good to lift each other up when we're all, when we experience the success. So any chance we can take to be like, hey, we're, you know, we, we are doing good, we are working hard, um, and we know that working together, we're going to see success. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I should say that we're going to, hoping to send uh, at least a couple of delegates to the Congress, uh, CHRS Congress coming up in April, and uh, we might do something similar sharing afterwards. Um, I, I do want to mention the one thing for me, I've seen so often in the media these days, uh, well, for the last few years, uh, has been this um, housing crisis um, and homelessness crisis that is building across Canada, that, that we're at a crisis level. Um, and every time I, I see that, or even as I type that, I, I always hesitate because Indigenous peoples have experienced a housing and homelessness crisis for hundreds of years. And uh, that has never been adequately addressed in, in Canada it's a history. Um, and it's certainly something we need to be paying much more close attention to and, and changing the way things are done. Okay, thank you, Steve. And, and did you say something? Can I add to that quickly? Yes, who, who is this? With? It's Tessa. Yes, yes, I, think, I think one of the other things too is that we keep on talking about a housing and homelessness crisis and housing and homelessness is a symptom. We have an inequality crisis. Right. right. Um, and we have a crisis that is about greed and allowing people to hoard wealth and allowing corporations to not pay their fair share. And so. Okay. Thank you, Tessa. All right. I want to give some good time now to Michelle Biss, who is joining us.
And let me... Great. That's a perfect segue, probably, for my presentation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I'll start by saying that um, my name um, is Chris. I hang, on, hang on, Michelle. Can you hang? I'm just trying to find you here and so I can pin you. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm having to scroll through. Mm -hmm. So I think as soon as she starts talking, she's going to be the video that comes up for everyone anyway. Okay. That's how Zoom works. Okay, go ahead, Michelle. Okay, great. I'll just start, uh, just before you start uh, with questions, Jordan, because I know you've got a couple lined up. Um, I'll just start by saying that I'm joining you here from the traditional territory of the Algonquin peoples. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about the human rights approach to housing segues really beautifully, I think, to what Steve and Tessa have been talking about, as well as a couple of other folks. Um, and I just wanted to start off by saying that, though I won't be talking about the intersections of indigeneity too, too much in this, in, in my answers, we do very much support the call for an Indigenous rural and urban housing strategy and support those Indigenous organizations and individuals who are calling for it as a form of self-determination for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And with that, Jordan, sorry, go ahead and ask my questions. That's okay. So first question, why is it so important that we consider the right to housing when discussing homelessness and precarious housing? Okay, well, as, as Tessa so aptly put her finger on, one of the biggest issues with the housing crisis in Canada is that we have a growing focus of housing as a commodity rather than as a human right, rather than being rooted in the idea of equality. What the right to housing provides us is it's a formative legal framework. It's a legal framework that allows us and requires us, in fact, both as governments, as different uh, frontline service providers, and just as individuals within this country, consider the concept of housing and homelessness through a human rights lens. It means that when, for example, governments are creating the national housing strategy, they have to set goals and targets in line with human rights goals. So for example, to end homelessness. It also means that, um, that there has to be a, a commitment to the idea that housing is a human right, that it's something that has to be claimed, that those who are marginalized experience the most significant homelessness in this country. So we've already talked about indigeneity. There were issues in terms of um, marginalized young women. I would add to that persons of color, of course, persons with disabilities. We all know across the board, everybody on this call knows that specific marginalized groups experience uh, homelessness and inadequate housing in much more significant numbers. But what we've, we're kind of struggling to catch up with in Canada is this idea that homelessness is not just a housing crisis. Homelessness is also a crisis of access to justice. So there's a lot of structural barriers that come up uh, when we're thinking about the concept of homelessness and, and housing. So for example, there are some benefits that don't reach marginalized populations. Um, there's a growing increase in the financialization and over speculation of housing that drives further investment uh, rather than a focus on um, housing as a human right. Uh, we also know that some forms of housing don't even receive regulation. So for example, here in the province of Ontario, in the context of boarding houses, where some of our most marginalized populations live, those boarding houses are not subject to regulation under the Ontario Human Rights Code or the uh, Landlord and Tenant, um, or the Landlord and Tenant Act. So I can tell you from my frontline service work as a, as a lawyer, um, there were times when I would get calls from clients in boarding houses who would be evicted because they had an injury and had a disability, but there was nowhere to go. We could not claim those rights and say, no, it's a violation of a person's rights to be evicted from their home because now they've had an injury because there was no legal protection. We know that these massive gaps in the system exist and unlike rights like civil and political rights, say like the right to vote, it's very hard to exercise the right to house. <laughs> so for example, in the context of, of the right to, to vote on election day, you go, you cast your ballot. And if someone prevents you from that ability, you can go through the courts and say, why am I being excluded? But how do you do that for the right to housing? 
And we know that there's a lot of case law. There's a whole history of case law. I won't, I won't go through it in this session today, but there's a whole history of case law where advocates have tried to make this argument that we must be able to exercise the right to housing through the courts. And we've again and again hit many, many different barriers in being able to exercise those rights. Uh, but I have good news <laughs> today. For the first time in many years, I have good news. Um, and that is that in 2019, the National Housing Strategy Act was, was tabled and in fact received royal assent. And within the National Housing Strategy Act, um, many likely who are on this call today and many advocates had been pushing for a human rights claiming mechanism to be included within that housing act. And within that, we saw the, um, the creation of a federal housing advocate and a federal housing council where systemic claims related to the right to housing will be able to be uh, assessed, investigated, assessed, and referred to a council. And so that's um, one of the, the pieces of good news about uh, ways we will actually be able to work and use the right to housing. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, but so how, so how do they access that? Yes. <laughs> and That's the question. The, that is the big question, right? And, yeah. you know, the reality is, is that just like equality rights, right? Like say gender equality, we don't just reach the implementation or the, um, the recognition of a right or the, the meaningful implementation of a right overnight. It's a long process. And it takes a lot of time and involvement from folks in civil society to figure out and shape what that is. So right now, the structure that we have to address the right to housing, it includes, as I said, a federal housing advocate who will have the opportunity to invest when systemic discrimination occurs, to investigate, to gather facts, to assess those facts, and then refer those claims to a federal, the housing council, who will then go to a review panel and assess uh, where they believe that the systemic discrimination exists and what recommendations they would make to, make, to remedy that. Um, and then from there, those recommendations will go to the minister responsible and the minister will have an obligation to report back on whether or not they'll implement those recommendations. Now what's really critical though, for all of this to succeed, obviously we as civil society have to be very, very well mobilized, right? Because we, there are so many cases that we want to appear in front of the federal housing advocate. I can think of maybe a hundred <laughs> different cases. And I'm sure that folks on this call can think of lots of situations where in their work with individuals or their frontline experience or their personal experience, they've seen issues of systemic discrimination that absolutely should appear in front of this federal housing advocate. So last Thursday, coinciding with uh, CHRA's Indigenous Caucuses <laughs> campaign, uh, we released the National Right to Housing Network. And so what is the National Right to Housing Network? Um, I'm sure Jordan will very kindly put up the, the URL. Um, I would really encourage folks who are on this call to check out the URL. It's absolutely open to you as an individual or your organization to sign on and join the network and be part of this mobilization of civil society to figure out what the heck this means for us and how we can all constructively use the right to housing moving forward. So in my role, I'm now the project manager of this newly formed National Right to Housing Network. And together as civil society, we'll be figuring out how it is we can meaningfully use the mechanism that is the Federal Housing Advocate and the Housing Council. We'll be making sure that government officials understand that the right to housing exists, and that this mechanism has to be protected and meaningfully implemented at all costs. We'll be working to figure out the research component of this. What does it mean substantively in specific communities? Also working community initiatives with specific um, grassroots organizations across the country who also want to see the right to housing implemented at a municipal level or at a local level. And we'll also be figuring out what it means to test the right to housing. So working together with different right to housing experts and advocates, individuals, claimants, folks from civil society, 
to triage what cases we want to appear in front of a federal housing advocate, what decisions we want to see, and what how that can translate into really, really concrete recommendations. This is all very new <laughs> and very exciting. Um, and likely our time frame is a bit short to show that this can work. Um, so, so today I actually have a message of hope, which is very exciting for me. Um, but I'll ask folks, you know, if you are interested in joining the call for uh, the meaningful implementation of the right to housing, for joining this network, we are creating working groups to figure out how we want to engage with these issues. And so I'll encourage you to visit our website, sign up, and you'll start hearing from me. Thank you so much, Michelle. It is definitely exciting news and um, wow, just so, so, so important to make the human rights a focus and how do we do it? Um, I, my hat's off to you, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of layers to deal with. Um, so we're getting close to our one o'clock time. Um, I know it's gonna be difficult to answer questions in five minutes. Um, so I don't know if we have had any questions. I'll ask Jennifer if anyone has posted questions. If you haven't, you are welcome to. Uh, please post your questions. You can direct them to a panelist or just in general. Um, post that in the chat box now. Um, and while folks are doing that, um, I just want to uh, let you know that next week there will be a, a free webinar. Um, and I'm just going to put that in the <coughs> chat box called um, Bridges Out of Poverty, Bridging Teams, um, a project that I think might be of interest to a lot of uh, United Church community uh, uh, communities of faith, congregations, um, to engage in address um, poverty in your local communities. So please check that out if you haven't already heard about it. Um, so I just posted the link to Michelle's network above that, but Michelle's probably gonna post it again, which is great. <laughs> Um, and Susan Eagle had mentioned the um, United Church of Canada's uh, uh, report uh, from 2000 on housing rights and thank you for reminding me of Susan about that. I'm going to uh, look that up myself because I'm not familiar with that and um, I'm certainly not an expert on housing but I do try to make the connections between the people who are and the people who are doing the work out there. So thank you Michelle for that link. Um, resources. Are there good resources for people, particularly around rural homelessness? Um, are any of our panelists able to respond to that question? Michelle? Sure, I can. Um, I won't. Uh, I won't speak to it too much because perhaps there's other folks on here who are better experts than I am. Um, but I will say I know that um, I, I know that I am physically housed at the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness, um, and they just recently launched a national rural and remote uh, network. And so that might be something worth checking out. And I'm happy to see if I can find a link here and post it in the chat box. And I'll add the Homeless Hub. Um, so they're a great resource and they have a section on rural and I've posted that in the check box. Thank you very much folks. Anybody else have resources or any questions? Um, so the uh, Canadian, they had a rural stream. Are, are they going to have a rural stream in the next one? I guess they're just working on that now. Um, okay, any more questions? No, I'm not seeing any more. So I am going to wrap up um, within the hour. I think that's great. I wanna thank everybody for um, sharing uh, what you did today, um, for taking the time to meet with all the folks from across the country who were able to join us. And to those who did, who joined us from um, congregations, from community ministries, from social services, wherever you're joining from us from, thank you for whatever work you were doing. And uh, that might be another good conversation is just for inviting some of you to share the work that you're doing. Cause I know that every, people across the country are doing some amazing work um, and really ste stepping up to, to address this issue. Um, there's a few more comments there um, in the chat. 
box. So check those out before you, you leave today. I will leave this uh, conversation, the Zoom link open for a while. Um, so those of you who might want to connect can, 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 you, can do so either through chat or if there's not whole too, too many people, we can chat by video. Um, so thank you. Thank you to our panelists again, and um, we'll wrap up for today. Thank you.